So what we consider a solution is not a hunk of technology. It's actually a piece of technology that's been harmonized with what we call tactics, techniques, and procedures. The idea of, of ASM World Class is to find the most exciting speakers in materials engineering, no matter where they are in the world. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this online version of ASM Ontario chapter. I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Abdallah Al Sayed, and I'll be one of your hosts. I'm actually the chair for the ASM Ontario chapter for this year. So wherever there's an ASM chapter, there's an ASM chapter for you, wherever you may be in the world. So you can reach me at chair at asmontario.org, and I can help direct you to a chapter that's local to your area. So now I'd like to pass it on to Shane Turcott, who will introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, it's Shane. Uh, I'm the founder of the failure analysis company, Steel Image. I'm the author of the book, Dec Mechanical Failures, an introduction to fractography. Um, I once read that an army of one era would be easily defeated by an, an army of the next. So, you know, an army of World War I would easily mop up armies of Napoleon. Armies of World War II would have dominated World War I. And of course, militaries, you know, from, from the Vietnam and Gulf War would have, again, dominated the Germans in World War II. You get the idea. Now, it, it's not that the, the skills, determination, or heroics of the soldiers has changed. What's changed is the, the weaponry and equipment that they're using. Make no mistake, militaries are very much a competition of engineering, technology, and production. And for no organization are the stakes as high. We're not talking we're not talking profit at the end of a quarter. The benefits of getting ahead or the consequences of falling behind as a military and technology can change the course of the nation's history. Winning or losing comes with human consequence. I don't say this to dwell on the harshness that's constant throughout human history, but I, I say this to talk about what motivates and drives engineers that are supporting their troops. The engineers that are working very hard to make sure that their soldiers have advantages and can come home safely at the end of a hard day. Dr. Sean Welsh is one of those engineers. Dr. Sean Welsh is a part of the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Research Center. He's one of the key ideas guys in the U.S. military. Now, it's a real honor to have him. It's very rare to get someone like Sean to speak uh, on online like this. Now, one of, one of the accomplishments we can probably appreciate is that Sean was one of the key people in developing the Enhanced Combat Helmet, which is introduced in 2013, it's one of the few helmets that could actually, sorry, it's the first helmet ever that can actually stop a bullet and have the ability to save a soldier from a, a direct hit from an AK-47. As a materials and manufacturing engineer, even though he is a materials and manufacturing engineer, he's not here to talk about the material specifically, partly because that's classified. But we've asked him to come here and talk about the ideas, innovation, and the mindset required to stay at the very cutting edge of technology. I hope this today is just kind of a casual presentation um, to give you a sense of, of what we do, why we do it. And um, I'm just going to kind of start rolling through. So I have basically five themes I want to share with you, you know, just kind of distilled them down to what I hoped would be of interest to people of a general audience, but with a particular interest in materials and manufacturing science. So to answer your question, Jane, earlier about my background, I am a mechanical engineer. My degrees are in mechanical engineering, including my terminal degree uh, in mechanical engineering. But what, what it says on my resume is, is SME, subject matter expert. It's a term we use because even though I got minted as a mechanical engineer, I've done most of my work uh, doing uh, manufacturing science at the laboratory and engineering for uh, getting the materials out off the lab bench and into things. So that's going to be a theme here is the motivation for why we why the Army pursues both science and technology, a sort of self-critical look uh, in general, not just at the Army, but use us as an example, but more generally, are we solving the right problems? Because as engineers, we just love to solve problems, but are we solving the right ones? Then um, our mission, our new mission at the Army Research Lab, operationalizing science for transformational overmatch, and I'll present some of that information. And then the rise of complexity. Uh, Shane just made a great case for that by comparing different uh, war fighting capabilities from one era to the next. And then something else I, I'm working on, 
to work in progress, this idea I call collectives of disparate technologies. And uh, hopefully that will become more evident in, in why I think that's going to be very important, especially in the light of the rise of complexity. This is what gets me up in the morning. And I, I think a lot of my colleagues get up in the morning because of this motivation right here. Uh, these are the people we work for. Okay. In, in, in a commercial language, we would consider them our customers, but these are our stakeholders. These are the people that are relying on us, the scientists, engineers of the army to make prudent decisions on their behalf of separating what seems like a promising technology and seems like a cool gadget to what they really need. We're really not into chasing what the coolest, latest trend is, unless it just happens to be coincident with what the soldier needs in the future. And, and that's a very critical point that I need to carry throughout this presentation is that oftentimes we, we think that it's technology that makes the difference. Isn't it a shame this very nicely pointed out? It's not. Technology by itself is not the thing that makes the difference. It's the ability of the soldier to assimilate that into performing his or her mission that makes a difference. So what we consider a solution is not a hunk of technology. It's actually a piece of technology that's been harmonized with what we call tactics, techniques, and procedures. How the soldier uses a UAV, for example, to deliver uh, some effect or to gather information or, or, or things along those lines. That's what we consider to be the solution, a complete solution. It's a combination of training, learning, doctrine, concepts, and the technology. But again, this is a big motivating factor, and I, I want to start here because these are the people that motivate us because they go to the most dangerous places. They go where they're asked to do without question, and the least we can do is try to find the best technologies for them. So I'm going to start right here, kind of semi-provocative. Are we solving the right problems? Question mark. Right? That's something that I think we need to ask, because for one thing, the rate at which technology is progressing, but the amount of different types of technologies that are emerging, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, new alloys, robotics, quantum computing, okay, these are all distinct, but obviously in some ways complementary technologies or self-reinforcing potentially. And they're emerging so quickly, and so aren't the, the technologies, the end self-driving vehicles, uh, UAVs, and so on, uh, micro uh, satellites, and so on. These have implications by themselves, but just as importantly, as you'll see, I hope, towards the end of my presentation, collectively. The question then becomes, you know, what is it that the soldier really needs, right? We might think that they need steel or alloy, right? Just as a scientist, I work really, really hard as a materials person on either developing a new lightweight alloy, structural alloy for a vehicle, or I work on a new manufacturing process to get the cost down or make complex shapes with it. And I just assume that if I work really hard on doing that and I get like a 15% increase in Young's modulus, right? Or I reduce the weight 20%, the, the, the density of the, of the alloy, then the army is gonna love it. And then the answer is that that's not the, that's not the easy answer anymore. It really depends on how that technology is going to be exploited at the systems level, and that's become increasingly complex. So it's very important that up front, uh, you know, are we defining the problem correctly? So getting a little bit on this philosophical soapbox just for a moment, it's a simple slide, but very important, is that the Army is, you know, very, very, to its own credit, taking a hard look as to understanding, like, where its new solutions are going to come from. We look at scientists almost as that that realm of the art of the possible, right? They're just very good at, at, at asking questions. Is it basic research by nature is agnostic from an application. That's the joy of it. They, people are just curious, like, how does this work? Why does this, why does this butterfly able to have such motility? Why is it able to operate the way it does with, with seemingly ease? So scientists are motivated by curiosity to discover the fundamental principles underlying what we we observe in nature, not necessarily judge them, but just kind of try to translate them into uh, scientific terms that can be shared and, and understood. On the right side, you have engineers like me and others. Engineers love to solve problems, right? They, I would argue a simple definition of an engineer is they want to put science to work and they want to transform science into technology. 
And science and technology are related, but they're not the same. And I think that's one key thing about the Army Research Laboratory is that we respect that. Uh, science is where a lot of the magic comes from. That's where the disruptive stuff starts. It starts very slowly, starts with some casual observations, but those casual insights compound into science. And then all of a sudden you have something like the laser emerge and the physics to justify it and, and understand it and control it. And then that paves the way to exploit it. They each have their strengths and weaknesses. Scientists are very good about, you know, casually observing things and they do publish in their journals. But the real question is, and this is the thing we're asking in the lab, is can we get better as scientists, the people that are scientists, uh, both internal and external to the, to the Army, by the way, and that includes international partners, right? Um, but can we get better as scientists in at least, okay, we don't have an application for technology, but at least making engineers aware of what this phenomena can do. It may not even have a, a reason why it should be used or why it's important. It's just, it's just interesting. Let the engineers see it earlier and let the soldiers see it earlier. So that's one thing we're doing. And on the other side of that equation, if you will, the engineers, right? We're very, very good at, you know, trying to answer problems come up with the answers. Really, before we run off on our pet projects of something we'd like to work on, I want to make a better robot. I want to make a lighter alloy. We stop and we ask, is this, you know, based on all the questions I could ask, have I asked the right questions? We get better like a scientist does and kind of just observe and compare. And that's what we're trying to emphasize here. So that research is reconnaissance of future capability, the kind of thing Shane was alluding to, is that anticipate that we, we may not be fighting or engaging in the way we are right now. And, and that's our job, is to anticipate how emerging technologies might manifest into capabilities that unfortunately people might put to less than benign uses on behalf of humanity. And so we have to be able to, to anticipate that, right? Again, my job is a technology person, I'm not a policy person. I, I, our job is basically to protect the soldier and to put technology to work for the soldier. And that also includes science and that's what we're we're really designed to do. So we often emphasize innovative solutions, but again, I'm going to keep harping on this problem aspect of it. Why couldn't we become more creative in defining the problem in the first place? That's critical. Why can we not spend more time in defining the problem? And solving problems demands one type of innovation. Creatively defining the problem also demands a type of innovation, maybe not necessarily the same type of innovation, but more creativity. And, and I think there's a huge benefit and huge rationale for doing that. And uh, I'm going to try to give some examples of that. If you were to ask me years ago, how do we improve soldier survivability? If you ask me, Sean Walsh, given that my background as an SME in materials and manufacturing science, my, my first impulse is, and I'm also a composites uh, guy, was I know how to do this. Let's let's make a lighter weight helmet using these new materials like ultra high molecular polyethylene, which is exactly what I ended up doing, by the way. That was 15 years ago. And if you ask me now, right this moment, how would we improve uh, soldier survivability? I would include that as an option, new materials, absolutely. But I would make you aware that there are other ways to answer that question broader, and we should open up the aperture. This is what I mean by enriching the problem definition space, because you might think, well, what is what is a UAS, an unmanned aerial system or, or vehicle? Or what does a robot shield on a, a, a robot do for a soldier? Or what does augmented reality have anything to do with protecting, increasing soldier survivability? And it turns out a lot. So let's just pick one. Let's pick the augmented reality software and devices, right? If a soldier can be trained to use his equipment or her equipment better and faster, if they have uh, the ability to process a lot of multiple streams of information where danger is from remote sensors on UAVs, for example, then they can reduce the risk of exposure to adverse events. That translates into soldier survivability, uh, increasing soldier survivability. You have to sometimes disrupt your own successes. And the Army is famous, you know, iconic, right? The helmet, a, a ballistic helmet and body armor is an iconic pieces, piece of equipment for the soldier, right? Everyone can understand that. But less iconic and less familiar are the ideas of UAVs and augmented reality systems and robots with protective shields possibly. But they're entirely feasible, and they're also, in some cases, very practical and potentially quite dramatic in, in their way of, of improving soldier protection. So what I'm trying to simply illustrate to you here is 
lot of a lot of advantages to looking at the problem in a bigger way and, and that and answering that question in a bigger way if you reframe the problem uh, and really think about asking the right research questions it opens up a lot of opportunity for a lot of the people uh, involved and interested in putting work together to, for the soldier so real quick uh, this slide is important um, this is how the army thinks we think in terms of how to inform we the scientists and, and you know, technologists, the engineers of the Army, how we inform combat power and warfighting capability. And basically, the Army considers itself uh, having to have control over eight elements of combat power. I'm not going to read all of them. They're right there. But obviously, they're coupled, right? Just pick one. Sustainment, right? The ability to bring things in and out logistically to keep the, the fight going. Or uh, movement and maneuver, right? Be able to, to get in, get out, you know, accomplish a mission without any delays uh, and do it effectively. But they're all coupled, right? You need information, you need protection, you need sustainment to accomplish movement maneuver in many cases. So there are a couple problems too. Point of this is, is that these are the elements that are informed by S&D, either individually or collectively. And that's why it's important to at least have an awareness that if you're interested in how um, to improve what we consider our customers' capability, our stakeholders' capability, to understand what they have to do. So it's sort of empathy from an engineer's perspective. What, what's it like to be a soldier in a very dynamic, hostile, evolving situation with a lot of information, a lot of stuff happening around them that they can and can't see? How do we help them make better decisions, implement those decisions decisively, and come home safely? So this is a snapshot, a publicly released snapshot of what ARL, the Army Research Lab, DEVCOM ARL, Army Research Lab, considers to be, at the moment, its critical, essential research programs. And you'll find some overlap if you find, like, the top 10 areas in from other companies around the world, even, and countries. Everyone's obviously very interested in artificial intelligence for obvious reasons. And for some non-obvious reasons, right? But AI is a very pervasive technology. So uh, same can be said for robotics and so on. But then there are some very unique things to the Army, even as opposed to the Air Force or the Navy. And operating on the ground or near the ground, that's our business. Uh, that's what we have to focus on. And doing that well and seamlessly with our uh, the fighting men and women from the Army and the Navy and, and the Air Force and the Marines, I mean, th that's very critical. And so what technologies do we as the Army need and that as part of within our own units and our own forces and squads and platoons and battalions? But then how do those interface seamlessly with the larger U.S. forces and then beyond that, our allies, right? Very critical. I've always been, uh, for, for many years now, have been very critical to us in our engagement. So that takes a, an enormous amount of coordination. But this gives you a snapshot of, and you'll see materials are obviously evident in there, but you see a very diverse level of investment because that's the way the world is going. We need footprints in some very intense and very important areas. ARL has a new mission and I really like it. Um, it's called operate, the actual name of the mission, frankly, I added one word to it, is operationalizing science for transformational overmatch because because I didn't think everyone would understand what overmatch means. It's more of an army or DOD centric term. I added the word capability, but hopefully you understand what operationalizing science means. And maybe you don't, that's okay too. But basically it means that we are not a university at the Army Research Laboratory. Universities have a very, very critical function, you know, basically to produce students, generate knowledge, agnostic from applications in many cases, spin off companies, inspire people to think differently, et cetera teach, learn, share. Our issue, our objective, and the challenges we face is there's a lot of science emerging. What's the right science? And how do we operate, operationalize it? How, and that's a very Army-like type term. It's like, how do we put it to work for the soldier? And overmatch basically means that it's not, it's, it's simply not acceptable to be good enough or as good as an adversary. We have got to have overmatch, which simply means that when we go in, it's an uncontested uh, win. It's we get in, do the mission, and we move out. And having that competitive advantage is very critical. And that also manifests in the capability we use. So that's the idea behind that. And that it's a very exciting mission, and it's driving basically a lot of the way we're thinking nowadays in a much sharper way. I'm going to give you kind of one, one example of what I think operationalizing science, material science, looks like, given that 
this audience seems to have a strong interest in material science. On the left is a group of researchers, engineers, diverse group, by the way, with different backgrounds, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, working together to actually elevate state-of-the-art analysis and capabilities of materials, right? To get new insights at the, you know, very small structural levels, at different length scales to see what's happening there under extreme events. What you're looking there is a crack propagation associated with a, a high-speed ballistic impact at a material level on a sample. And those are failure mechanisms. And they look like, oh, it's all broken up and terrible. Actually, no, that, that's a very positive thing because that's an energy absorbing and dissipation uh, mechanism. It's very effective. And then what you have in the middle there, the understand it part. So first is seeing it, right? And it's an iterative process. You can, you know, but typically you want to see what's happening first. You have tools to do that. And there's different ways to do that. Modeling, intuition, obviously using these computer tomography tools, right? Some subscale, subscale experiments to, to just explore the parameters of the problem, parametric studies and so on. Then you want to understand the problem. And then and basically, once you begin to understand it in the context of, of, of what it might be used for, then you can actually begin to apply it. And, and you really need to understand like what's going on, like what, what are the mechanisms here? And, and in this case, what's happening is a bullet's hitting a piece of ceramic, which is backed by a composite material, lightweight composite material. And uh, where you see this term 090, is if you see the bulge in the back of the 090, it's much bigger, it's bigger than the bulge where the hybrid is. That's because these were observations that were made at the seed phase and begin to exploit them at the, uh, at the understand it phase, begin to exercise some control. Why is that important? Well, we wanna stop the bullet on the soldier. That's critical. Preventing penetration is one step, but we also wanna mitigate what we call blunt trauma, minimize the deformation associated with it. So that's, that's understanding in that mechanism. Then ultimately applying it, right? Once we have that under control and we really have confidence, we can scale that up and we can produce things like body armor. That's the idea. Now I'm going to share something quite different, but same idea. And this is really a homage to why the Army Research Lab and the Army Futures Command, when it was formed, realized that we have to work with researchers outside our walls. Very, very important. We know that other people are doing very interesting science, very interesting research very interesting engineer, engineering. So in this case, I just picked one. This is a gentleman I met a couple of years ago at a meeting, Professor Andres Arrieta from Purdue University. And he was fascinated by how an earwig's wings deployed. And you might think, well, what in the world does that have to do with the army? And the, the, the honest answer you can initially say is, I don't know. But when I saw it, what he was trying to understand is what's fascinated, what fascinated him was that the wing compacts so greatly and so efficiently. If he could understand that mechanism, which he and his team did, by the way, and replicate it, I think his intuition was this mechanism could be useful for other devices, and I agree. And so what I did is on the right side is just hypothetically mapped out some areas that might be useful to that. So anyways, I want to pick up the pace here, but you can kind of get the idea that, that um, you can kind of get the idea that these are uh, phenomena that are emerging from our from our laboratories and and from laboratories external to us that might benefit us and and being able to exploit these new mechanisms these in these new insights you know are important to to new army systems and they may not by themselves originate in an army lab so that should give you some interest and hope that we do pay attention to the papers you write. And when I say you, I mean the international community, as well as obviously within the United States, it's very important. It's all well and good to ask the right questions, solve the right problems, see it, you know, understand it and apply it. But at some point you need an engine to start consuming that innovation. And I'm not gonna stay on this for very long. I, if you have time, I would recommend you take a look at Henry Trespo's open innovation model. Now cases can be made for closed innovation, which basically means not invented here syndrome type thing where, well, that's not a, that's a kind of a crude way of putting it. But the, the idea is this reasons why you might want to have a lot of technology developed behind closed doors, both in the commercial and obviously in the military sector. But where there's an opportunity and it's safe to do it and there's a reason to do it and often to mutual benefit, you also want to and keep open the possibility that you can integrate innovations from both the Army laboratory or DOD lab and, and external sources. And that, by the way, can include uh, external international partners, right? There's mechanisms for doing that. I'm not gonna get into them here, but, but the point is, again, for all the points I made earlier, 
We realize that it, there's innovations emerging all around the world faster than we can consume them. Question is then again, what's the right way to consume them and turn them into capability, which is what we care about. But just throwing this model out, recommend it really to pique your interest to, to type, maybe take a little bit look, deeper look at it. It's, a, it's an engine for now, once we see these cool innovations, these interesting innovations, how do we transform them into useful technologies? So I'm gonna give you an example of, of impact of actually creating capability, and then I'm going to move on to something a little bit more timely. Uh, again, giving a nod to Shane uh, of the how things change and how technologies change and how they can change the effects on the battlefield. Steel, I'm going to say, I'm going to go on record, I'm being recorded, steel is still a great armor. I'm going to say it again for all the steel fanatics. Steel is still a great armor. There's one problem with steel. It has like, what, a specific gravity over seven? And ultra-high molecular polyethylene has a specific gravity around 0.98, which means it floats in water. I haven't seen a steel float in water yet. I'm not saying that's impossible, but I haven't seen it yet. You know, we have to be vigilant of what's coming down in terms of technology. The capability persists, the idea, the need of protecting the soldier's head against uh, blunt trauma and ballistic impact, right? Preventing the projectile from penetrating the shell of the helmet. But the way we do it, the mechanisms we use and the materials we use have evolved. And, and really, to be honest, the, the real revolution was going from steel to ultra high uh, to, to Kevlar. Kevlar was a synthetic material developed by DuPont originally known as an aramid fiber with a thermal set uh, polymer matrix. But that was a truly revolutionary transition. It was state of the art, really beautiful science uh, translated into really great technology. And then the natural cause was, you know, we're a research lab. How do we make that obsolete? And what, what that was, was another material that had already been around before I got in the game, and that was ultra high molecular polyethylene. It's a mouthful, a lot more syllables than Kevlar, but this material is remarkable, okay? And not only, it has what we call a high ballistic mass efficiency, meaning it has the ability to resist penetration at a very light weight. Obviously, a very desirable thing in many cases for, for especially for body armor where soldier has to carry the stuff on their backs. This is a real quick snapshot of, you know, five years of my life, but it was a story of how we transformed science, basically the science of, uh, that had led to the development of ultra high molecular polyethylene. And although we didn't develop the, the, these materials, we definitely did research on understanding how they behave. That's that's a digital image correlation uh, image you see on the lower left there um, to understand how it respond and how it dissipates energy and how we exploit that basically part of the see it, if you will. And then the technology part, um, the animation, I hope it's playing. That's just one way. That's not the way or only way to make a helmet. It's just that we explored many, many different manufacturing techniques from a manufacturing science standpoint, hence the SME there. Uh, declaration. Um, the idea being that we want to give an honest shake to uh, different approaches, which came from different ideas, which were both internal and external to ARL. And then ultimately the capability manifested from that, which was the helmet itself. And two helmets came out of it, but the one I'm going to talk about here is the enhanced combat helmet. Uh, first ever helmet to have a defined level of smart arms protection, 35% higher protection than Kevlar, which was already or aramid fibers, I should say, because there's Tuaron as well. Um, these materials are phenomenal materials too. Kevlar is still a great material. Tuaron uh, is still a great material. Uh, still used in, in some cases, in some applications. Um, but again, just on a weight basis, in terms of ballistic resistance, uh, ultra molecular polyethylene, things like Spectra and Dyneema are been fantastic materials. Uh, it got recognized to work, but the most important part of this whole slide is down at the bottom. Community of interest. This was not a one person show. This was not the Sean Walsh show. This was, uh, I was a catalyst for building the team, and that team involved uh, what's now called uh, DEVCOM Soldier Center. It involved the PEO Soldier, uh, involved US industry, small and small companies, by the way, frankly, and uh, real teaming and, and, and integrating that to get the best result for the soldier. So here's the payoff from that. It's not often that you can trace your research and uh, to impact for the soldier as clearly as this. And I'm very grateful that I'm able to do that. That gentleman sitting, standing right there with the helmet, 
he got that helmet back, the helmet that saved, basically he was wearing the day he was shot and in on his helmet and that helmet was returned to him. That helmet came from our research, our cumulative research. That's, a, that's an ECH, enhanced combat helmet that he was wearing. And it's part of what's called the return event. This, the Army holds on to it for a while, does an analysis. And then, because it's obviously a significant event, a soldier was wearing this helmet when they encountered this life-threatening situation, it's returned to them. Uh, and, and oftentimes this is done in, in a ceremony. All that work paid off. That soldier standing there with his helmet, and that's what kind of motivates us. But the, the point I'm trying to make is we can't get nostalgic. Now, the question is, how do we protect him tomorrow and his friends tomorrow and the people that he may never know that go to serve for the U.S. Army tomorrow? That's what we need to do. So I'm going to give you uh, an example of what we're working on now, we're, something that's very common to you all, uh, probably on the commercial side of, of things. But something that's relatively new to you know to what we're doing, uh, and the idea of, of using what we call minimum viable product frameworks to begin to make a earlier connection of, of our lab discoveries to capabilities as a way to communicate them between scientists, engineers, and soldiers. And so, for those who aren't familiar with it, I won't go on to excruciating detail here. I, I recommend you look this up. There's many, many good uh, examples of what an MVP is. But long story short, an MVP is an iterative cycle. And you start with an MVP, a minimum viable product. It could be a sketch on a piece of paper. It could be a model. It could be a model made out of cardboard. Um, but in, in some cases, it could also be materials that you've just fabricated and that shows certain properties. And so you make it and then you start sharing it and you start to get, you start getting feedback from that. And you experiment and analyze that feedback and generate knowledge. And then you refine that concept. And, and you discover unknown unknowns, and I'm going to ex explain that in more detail, but it's a very powerful, very simple mechanism. Other people have more uh, elaborate ways of doing this nowadays, like Agile and Scrum and so on, but for the most part, this is a very powerful mechanism. So I'm going to give you an example, a real-time example of where we're applying this at, in a research laboratory. Now, admittedly, when you're doing science, you don't do products, right? So it's really almost like minimum viable discoveries, right? trying to put them in context. So some researchers at ARL, we're intending to uh, develop a lighter weight alloy, a metal alloy, a structural alloy. They were not intending to create any sort of power or energy source. And so when they were making and fabricating these samples, they had to do corrosion tests. And what you see in the beaker there is a sample of this a disc, small tablet of this, and it just reacts quite violently, not, not explosively, but it, and what they found was the entire sample disappeared. And in, in so doing, when it was added to water, it converted into hydrogen. And that's not what they wanted. But that ended up being a very interesting phenomenon, generation of hydrogen. Why would that be interesting? But one thing, it's an aluminum alloy. And so it's relatively light. For another, it takes water, which you wouldn't have to carry that, you know, basically you, you could carry it or you could find it in, in theater. And the idea is like maybe this could be a way to recharge their devices because you, if you take the hydrogen and you put it through a fuel cell, you can generate electricity. And what you're seeing on the left is what we would actually call a discovery demonstrator. Simply a balloon, child's balloon, if you will, being filled with hydrogen from the reaction. Okay, that, that's just a phenomenon. On the right is our early minimum viable product. Simply captured that hydrogen, ran it through a fuel cell generated electricity, went to Home Depot, not advertising for them, but I'm just saying that we literally took a ride, got a paid out of home pocket, just got a uh, quick lantern and just wanted to demonstrate that this thing works, okay? That light a light. We showed it to soldiers. And what happened was, because we were just excited, okay? So, you know, we wanted to show this and we, we you know, we got permission to work with soldiers, because safety is first. Even when you're showing science and technology to soldiers, by the way, you can't just randomly put things in their hands. It has to be approved. But we, 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 we showed our little device to them. And what happened was, unexpectedly, what we were just expecting them to give us feedback on was, you know, maybe just what they thought of it or whatnot. But unexpectedly, they started thinking about, when we showed them the actual guts of it, like the, the pellets, they were giving us suggestions on what we, you know, how to store it, what concerns that they would have. And we captured that information. 
And so this is very critical. Sharing that, that discovery early helped us inform the capability. One of the suggestions they said was this would have to be protected because they get wet. And so the stuff couldn't pre-activate by getting wet. So we worked on our next minimum viable product to actually encapsulate it in plastic. And we actually built it, although it looks like a finished product, it is a minimum viable product. We actually built a working prototype, a minimum viable product, if you will, that would automate the opening of that package, start the reaction, and generate the electricity. And what you're seeing here, hopefully it's playing, is actually a device that tears open the uh, pellets in the package and releases them for the reaction. Now, what I'm trying to share with you, and this is what we discovered with this minimum viable product. It seemed like very logical, but it also identified some issues very early before we start scaling this and locking into this. We discovered things like, for example, the packaging the plastic that we use might be a little bit too stiff. So that has to be softened so that the pellets all release from the packaging. We discovered that the waste which is environmentally benign, basically needs to be dealt with because it actually generates a voluminous amount of waste and it has to be dealt with and it could actually affect the final design. But the point was this helped us discover what it would really take to transform this discovery into a capability at the product level. This is not something we generally do. It's a bad assumption to just think that a discovery in the lab bench is just gonna leap off that lab bench and into the hands of the soldier. This is the intermediate step where we get dirty in the lab, basically kind of our hands dirty and we have frustrations and we learn things that we didn't anticipate when you start to systematize. Now, of course, we enter this with a hypothesis, right? We don't just do this random. We had a reason to build it like this. But along the way, you discover things because it's a complex problem in the end. It looks simple, but it's very important. But I'm just sharing with you that it's proving to be a very effective, very cost-effective, very fast way to identify issues early. So now I'm gonna change the game. Um, I, I've been talking about, you know, more or less conventional materials development, still bread and butter at our research laboratory. Uh, pushing on advancing new materials is very, very critical. But as I was alluding to, just take a look around in your own world, right? Just how complex information is flowing, how complex systems are working together, how things are happening much quicker. These are factors that are also going to affect the military and in, in ways that we need to understand and anticipate and prepare. For. Complexity is just one term, but it's a very good one. And not to say that prior wars, even the ancient wars, didn't have their own level of complexity, but certainly with the rise of AI, that's changing. Not saying that these are the only three important factors in the future battlefield, but again, even from a com competitive standpoint in the commercial sector, what's mattering increasingly one speed two interoperability and three complexity and instead of becoming a victim of complexity and being overrun by it how do you own it how do you exploit it i think and, and the way you exploit complexity is not necessarily the same way you would have present for, for example made incremental or even disruptive improvements in a single material it, it requires a, a sort of a different and more holistic mindset and, and increasingly, you've got to get comfortable with the intersections between distinct realms, like the human realm, which has its own characteristics, feelings, thoughts, cognitive responses, physical limitations, and so on. The physical realm, things like robots, bullets, helmets, electronic devices, radar. And the virtual realm, things like AI, the cloud, uh, computation, artificial intelligence, uh, devices, and, and uh, machine learning, and so on. And then, of course, the intersections of those, right? So any one of those realms is complex in and of itself, but then the intersection of them. And the lower bottom is where the Army is thinking now. It's publicly available. You can read about it. It's called the Multi-Domain Operations, MDO. And it recognizes the complexities coming, and it recognizes a need to converge multiple assets across these domains. And so we're looking at what's the science that's going to enable that. And here's the danger of it, okay? Um, Here's the danger of getting too nostalgic for uh, the way we used to do things. Again, a nod to Shane for pointing that out, very insightful at the beginning. Rifles and helmets and body armor are tank and man tanks. These are iconic army pieces of equipment. They're still critical to us. Okay, I want to be very clear. But what the army's realizing is, while that's happening, there's other things happening in the world of AI, robotics, uh, microsatellites and so on. 
And it's keeping an eye on that, obviously, not just keeping an eye, but how do we prepare to exploit that as well? This idea that we just rely and bank on singular technology break breakthroughs, still critical. We still need that new breakthrough material, that new device, that new technology that, you know, that will be a game changer by itself. But there's a danger increasingly of relying only on singular phenomena. And this is a little playful, but obviously there's a famous example of, you know, people in an engineer, very elaborate device that could rotate and listen for sounds using parabola, very well-known phenomenon to concentrate sound waves. Uh, and then obviously radar emerged, which made it, you know, basically obsolete very quickly. Radar emerged, but what I want to highlight here is the radar is itself a great example of technology convergence and complexity. You had innovations in electric magnetic radiation and understanding that, and then the ability to develop microwave generators and transmitters and power supplies, the results of which when they converged gave us the ability to track moving objects from a great distance. And that was a game changer. That was a really huge game changer still very important technology. But again, it came from multidiscipline research, but also just technologies emerging from these different fields that coalesced. So the innovation wasn't just from any one of those technologies, but obviously in the in the harmonization of those into a capability. So emergence, uh, real quick here again, uh, this is a phenomenon you're probably intuitively aware of. And on the left, ants forming bridges with their bodies to bring food back to the nest. It benefits the entire colony. Um, self-assembly behavior, typically with similar uh, species, right? Similar self-assembly of similar uh, species uh, or, or members of the, you know, they're all ants. But this can also be done with heterogeneous colonies as well. And on the right, you have work at Georgia Tech from Dan Goldman's lab, Professor Dan Goldman's lab, fascinating work where they are looking at smarticles, basically a robot that can't do anything until you put it in a ring with other robots and, and shot one of them off, creates an asymmetry and the, all of a sudden the whole colony can move. That's an example of emergent behavior. And what's fascinating about it is it's actually an artificially produced example. And it's also a great analogy because now how do we create more of that? Because this is a new capability, a desired behavior, i.e. the ability to move from one point to another, but achieved not from your conventional wheels, tracks, and legs and robots. And so what I'm offering here, this is where my work is going on right now, and is, is, is this idea I'm advertising as collectives. And I'm using the term collectives to get away from the terms like systems and so on, because there's a lot of baggage with that. And, and same thing with convergence. It's become obliterated and obscured because it's being used in so many different ways. Simply trying to point out that collectives are a bunch of disparate technologies that can be harmonized. And then when you put them in that way, they can form new relationships. There's a biological rationale for this. Nature does a very good job of exploiting complexity. And it even has terms, thanks to biologists, uh, things like phyletic gradualism and punctuated equilibrium, which I recommend you look up. But long and the short of it is, why would we care about those biological terms as engineers? Well, they give you hope in the sense that they, uh, they can give you a rationale of why you would want to exploit like combinations of disparate technologies, because all of a sudden you can get a... So I'm going to start with a playful one example here. The woman, uh, her name is Lady Norman Florence there on, on a scooter over 100 years ago, 1916 traveled to work and around the London streets in London, England. And then all of a sudden, the explosion of, of dockless scooters, right? The, the disruptive in many ways, throwing these scooters all around the streets. You can just download, you know, an app and access them and pay for them and use them. But these are people that learned how to exploit complexity and actually profit from it. I would argue, and they probably might push back on me on this, but I would argue, show me where the real breakthrough technology is. I, I can't find it. The idea is what they really did was they paid attention to what the capability that was needed. And they did a great job, innovative job of assembling these disparate technologies to give that capability. They exploited complexity. There's a lot that we can learn from this from the Army's perspective. Again, I've, I've already introduced the fact that conflict and opportunity will, will occur in three primary realms, the human realm, the physical realm, and the virtual realm. Not my idea. This is stems from a, a prior work at, at the Army Research Laboratory. But on the left, I'm just re reiterating the fact that, that that scooter capability, that dockless scuba capability, harmonizes a collective of disparate capabilities like smartphones and cell phone towers and GPS and uh, secure payment options and so on. On the right, I tried to map what that might look like by analogy for the soldier in terms of protecting them and increasing their survivability. 
they're not relying on just their helmet and body armor, but they're also relying on the transmission of information uh, gathered by UAVs, ground vehicles, and, and remote uh, transmitting devices and software to basically make better decisions, implement their objectives, and make sure that they're minimally exposed to risk. Again, how do we exploit this inevitable and growing emergence of complexity and not be overwhelmed or surprised by it? Very critical, very, very critical to the future. And one way, again, is just take a very methodical approach to, again, conceptualizing ideas and solutions not just from singular technologies, although that's still viable, but also combinations of technologies. And then balancing them, what are our operational challenges? What do we need to do midterm, far term, and so on? And then what kind of potential solutions might emerge from that? And then again, using the minimum viable product framework to operationalize some of these ideas, to get them in the hands of the soldier, or as we say now, get our S&T into the dirt, so that the soldiers get some critical feedback on it. They learn to get comfortable with it. Sort of a campaign of learning, you know, like what, how would these soldiers use this combination or suite of technologies versus a singular technology? And then refine the technology and the operation of it, the teaching and how to use it so that it's used optimally. That's, that's the future. You saw earlier, we had a, a, a nano galvanic discovery, which can turn snow basically into hydrogen. And on the bottom right, is as, as a need, basically what we call continuous resupply. So imagine like a dense urban area and some of the uh, UAVs uh, take supplies that are delivered safely at the outskirts of a, a particular urban area where there's a conflict. And then they have to deliver the supplies closer to where the combat area is, is actively engaging. They could potentially use snow and our nano just galvanic discovery as an energy source. So at first you might think, well, what's the common link there? And, and the link is, in the middle is this complex integration of these disparate capabilities, artificial intelligence, possibly UAVs, fuel cell technologies, advanced battery technology, and of course, the new discovery, the, al the nano galvanic alloy. That's simply what I'm trying to highlight here. I'm just, this is a hypothetical. This is not a real program right now. I'm just giving you an example of how we might connect singular discovery in the materials area to a more complex capability. And these are my parting thoughts. Team is essential to success. Uh, can't, can't emphasize that. Uh, we do not have a monopoly, anyone in the world, I think now, on, on the best technologies in the sense that technologies are emerging around the world. And so we've got to be vigilant and be able to be nimble and respond and respect that science is, is a human uh, endeavor and, and it produces amazing things. And, and the question is, from our perspective is we need to be able to be aware of that and, and be able to understand it and, and, and apply it as we see fit to our mission of operationalizing science for transformational overmatch. I, uh, MVPs, I hope I've convinced you that they might potentially have role in a laboratory. I know companies are very familiar with these, but these are relatively new ideas in a laboratory. Uh, I hope I've also kind of at least challenged you to think about speed, interoperability, and complexity as, as a source of innovation and, and the need for better problem solving. Probably my biggest point is, is this idea of, of collectives of disparate technologies, not just singular breakthroughs. And I just want to thank, there's acknowledgements, but I especially want to thank today the ASM panel for, for working really hard. The endless sound checks at my request, because I uh, wanted to make sure that we got this off without a hitch. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and, and, and take any questions. Thank you. Thanks again, uh, Dr. Walsh, for the excellent talk. Some of the technologies being developed at ARL, some of them come from a need, and then others come from you develop something, and then and you're trying to find a fit for it. Maybe if you could give a little bit more detail on a portion of each, or uh, you guys target maybe one half being something that you meet the capability of the soldier, while others are more exploratory. Just to think a little more detail on the ratio. Well, I, I can't give a, a specific ratio, but we make investments in what we call 6-1 basic research, and we make investments obviously in 6-2. And we also make investments through uh, what we call Mantech programs, manufacturing programs, where we work on Mantech programs from our Thalma Research Laboratory. But the point is the 6-1 is focused on the art of the possible, if you will, right? Again, more towards what I was pointing out by nature, basic research is agnostic from an application. Now you might ask, well, if it's so agnostic from an application, then it's so generic, why can't it be done in the universe? There's a good argument for that. But there's certain things, there's certain phenomena like quantum phenomena or 
electronics phenomena, at a, you know, or or mater nanoscale materials phenomena uh, that are we know have the potential to manifest at the at the macro level or to the systems level, and we also have a high suspicion that there's going to be something useful there. Devcom executes by far the largest uh, basic research investment, and that includes the Army Research Office, by the way, which funds extramural research at universities in the United States. So they're out there looking for those really novel, um, well, things like Dan Goldman's work at uh, Georgia Tech, which I presented, the, the Smarticles work. He's interested in just something very fundamental, like motion and, and co uh, of complex animals and and artificial systems like robotics. And again, there's no specific application for that, um, but you can intuit that there's something uh, of relevance given that we work on the ground and we wanna be able to navigate un you know, uncontested over irregular terrain. So that's so that's one aspect. Then the 6.2 is, is applied, but it's, a, it's, it's an excellent question because we also work with what we call the centers, the DevCom centers, and they work more at the systems level and they begin to analyze where this technology is going to be applied to, let's just say, uh, a ground robot or UAS or a missile, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's our job to begin to do the, you know, the application of that technology so that it, it matures from a TRL, let's just say, of two or three up to a te technology readiness level. And I recommend people look that up if they don't know what that is, but a technology readiness of, a, of four, five-ish, somewhere in there. So, and, I, and that's not a direct answer to the question, but we, we need a balanced portfolio. Yes, yeah, so we do have a big footprint in, in basic research, but but again, we have a lot of engineers as well doing doing the application side. So I'll, I'll rephrase your question. You're, what you're basically, if I understand it, is yes, we're going to come up with solutions that look for a problem. That That is, right? We're gonna come up with discoveries that are gonna be looking for a problem to solve. But we also know you know, soldiers want lighter weight stuff, so we know what the problem is. That drives looking for lighter weight materials, so it works both ways. It's clear that you and your colleagues at ARL see your mission first and foremost to protect the soldier and increase soldier survivability. Is this why you pursued a career with ARL to begin with? Yes. Uh, I remember when I first arrived, This is I started my career in Watertown, Massachusetts. I remember walking through the door. I, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And was just the feeling that it's it wasn't really something that I had actually considered working for an army laboratory or a government laboratory. And then when I was taken on a tour by what would become my branch chief at the time uh, of the facilities and the historic importance of those facilities, the, the buildings are still actually in the historic register. They're, they date back to the Civil War. As a matter of fact, if you ever heard of Olmsted that did the design of Central Park, he one of his early projects was designing some of the grounds on that facility that I started at. But overall, when I walked in, I just saw, I'm, and the people I met, it was the people and the facilities and some of the projects that they worked on. I became part of the mission and I would say the, the mission became part of me, it, you know, it accumulated. I can't say I woke up in the morning and said, I'm gonna go work for this laboratory. It's just that once I started to, I was, I was I've been, in, they haven't been able to chase me out. Um, I'm coming towards the end of my career, but the point is, it's just like, I think 35 years in, is a pretty good indicator that I, I feel pretty strongly about getting up and doing something for the soldier. With increasing complexities in the leading edge of technology, how can we encourage creativity from an educational standpoint to improve how we ask the question for better solve our problems? I guess, and I tell people what to do or how they should do things. I think one of the most beautiful parts of education and, and knowledge is, is just keep asking questions. Even if somebody seems like they have the answer or they think this is what we have to do and I'm telling you this is the way to do it, question it. And question everything I've presented to you, uh, whether it resonates with you or not. I think that's the most important thing. I think that's the beauty of science is it questions unconditionally. I think too often we settle for answers given to us by other people. Um, and I, I would, I would, whatever I would, I would keep a light, you know, keep the light burning at these universities on encouraging curiosity and the people to express themselves and to ask questions as they see it, you know, and I'm not saying deny science or, or, or a good idea or anything like that. I'm just saying that a lot of times people end up, even with good intention, intentions, pushing a, on a, 
a way to do something because that's the way they feel comfortable. I think what we're, our job as researchers is to push people out of their comfort zones. So any way you can encourage that behavior of keep pushing um, to something maybe uncomfortable, but, but to the next thing is important. How do you know what, what, what the right horses or technologies to bet on? How do you know when something shows potential and when, and when something seems like it's going to be, or how do you know it's not going to become a dead end? So, so I, I don't want to be trite and, and say, if I had that power, obviously I'd be very well, wealthy in the stock market, right? Uh, I mean, what, what, what stocks to bet on? And I think what I tried to emphasize in, the, the, in my presentation with the minimum viable products and with complexity, which are separate, but can be related, there are unforeseen consequences when cer certain technologies converge that we may not be able to anticipate. I think part of it is exploratory prototyping things like MVPs, even conceptually, just thinking what if, if these technologies, these two or three technologies down the road converged, what could happen? You know, what asymmetric capability could emerge from that? And, and I think what you have to do is you have to test out some of those hypotheses. You start with a hypothesis, you stay faithful to the scientific method, don't just do it randomly, form a hypothesis of why you think this these things are, to, are are worth betting on, and then test out that hypothesis. What I'm trying to say is the MVP offers sort of an inexpensive and fast way of testing that out. But even, even today, not everything is predictable, despite how fast computers are and artificial intelligence emerging. And so you still have to explore. And I just think there's more tools to explore, like artificial intelligence and modeling and, and so on. So I think getting more comfortable in using those tools could reduce some of that to answer that question Better, but I still think you don't abandon the classic scientific hypothesis. Uh, so there are many inventions that originally had created by the military, and then they transferred over to civilian life. Is this taken into consideration when you're developing something new, or is it kind of uh, come at the end? So that's an awesome question. And the classic term, of course, we always advocate for what we would call dual use. All right, we care as much about the civilian as we do the soldier. But we have to care about the soldier. That's our job, right? So we have to be able to, to give the soldier something that you just can't go down to your local shop and uh, and get. And so that's where the overmatch comes from. It, it, we can't be as good as, right? You know, it's got to be better than. And, and we got to assure that what we're giving the soldier is better than. I take UAVs, classic example, right? I mean, you can buy some very sophisticated UAV capability over the internet and wherever. That's not good enough for us. And so and it's not it's not good enough for the soldier. So it's very critical to us that we we be aware of that. But yeah, I I, I just want to I want to emphasize that yes, it is important to us, but it, our primary focus is originally on the soldier. If it has dual use, that's great. Um, but given you know resources, we have a job to do. And that our job is basically making sure that we wake up in the morning getting that stuff best stuff into the hands of the soldiers first and then if it has commercial applications that are safe and are, we can release fine what is the average length from kind of concept to implementation and do you find this getting longer over time just because of increased complexity so that's an excellent question and it was one of the reasons quite frankly that the army futures command was founded the army futures command is just over two years old i actually had the honor of being uh, on the original team that helped form the task force that formed it and got to work with the, the Army senior leadership and support them as they, as they did this. And it realized that its, its modernization enterprise was fragmented. It was doing great stuff. It's just that it was bits and pieces were in different organizations. And so what it really tried to do is what we, it calls bring unity of effort to the, to the whole enterprise. And so part of that goal was to shrink the time from concept to capability but it is a reality and there's a great report you can google these things i don't have it off the top of my head but the um <clears throat> true scientific breakthroughs even to this day can take anywhere from 10 to 20 years to manifest into a capability no matter if you're doing everything right it's just it just takes it can take that long from discovery to capability and so, meanwhile, that's why things like complexity, being able to maybe mix and match, you know, emergent technologies, break early breakthroughs with uh, more higher TRL level technologies and integrate them in new ways to get new capabilities. Uh, 
radar obviously was an early example of that. I would argue robotics are a current example of that, right? We have a lot of understanding in electromechanics systems. Um, and now what happens when that starts to intersect with AI to control them better, right? More intelligently. And then, oh, oh by the way, we add better battery technology and, oh yeah, sensors. So, so the idea is that it really depends on the complexity of your system um, and, and so on. But uh, I, I think it's a valid question. It's something that we're very aware of. And this is exactly why we're exploring and, and, and not being arrogant to think we know the, all the answers. And that includes not just science and technology, but from the business sector, using ideas like value proposition, using ideas like strategic competitiveness models to, to assess certain technologies. And then as I shared, minimum viable product to help shrink that and do the, you know, identify the unknown unknown so that we do re reduce that cycle. But I don't think it's an easy answer. Um, and I don't wanna say that we're gonna go from 20 years down to 10. I think we could go down from 20 years down to two years, depending on what the technology is. And, but, but, but uh, it really depends on, on the complexity and the type of technology that we're talking about. John, one of the so things, nice. actually, if I can quickly say something, I mentioned one time, is that you had said that the, the, the length of benefit, the time of benefit from introducing an idea on, you know, onto the soldier, that it's diminishing. That, that now that, you know, people are getting very creative, uh, there's obviously a lot of copying going on, but once it would, might take a long time to put on a soldier, but then you have a long benefit for a long time. I think you imply that that, that duration of benefit is reducing. Yeah. I won't say that's true for all technologies in the army, but just take a look, just take a look at what's happening commercially, right? Um, just the shelf life of, of certain apps on, an, on a smartphone, for example. Uh, become obsolete every couple months or, 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 or software becomes obsolete and turns over. Software is a good, in general, is a, is a, it has a very short shelf life. And software is a blood, lifeblood of a lot of systems. So right there, that alone, the dependence that the DOD and the commercial sector have on state-of-the-art algorithms is, is, is kind of an example of what I'm talking about. Now you have something like legacy systems like Abrams tanks, classic, very important, still a projection of force, um, symbolic, important, uh, highly capable systems. But what we're what I'm offering here is that in addition to those systems, those legacy systems, there are emerging these other technologies that evolve very, very quickly. And that, that the same can be said for materials. Um, some materials are, are evolving faster. Now there's things like synthetic biology. And once you've cracked the code on, on genetic the genetic, be able to genetically modify materials or, or, or whatever, we don't know how that's going to be exploited. So there's obviously some positive to it, but there's always some concerns and, and, and being able to make an investment of that. That's why we have now a footprint in the synthetic biology area. That's not something that we had a very significant footprint in. So that's a reflection of being aware that some technologies are emerging and some might evolve faster and in more complex ways than others. Um, I would argue how often does a really too, truly new breakthrough material emerge? It's much more glacial than, for example, uh, some of the things that you're seeing in the complexities that you can achieve with artificial intelligence or robotics lately. Not to say one's more important than the other, but but that's what I mean is that that our, our systems in the UAV capabilities 10 years ago, 20 years ago, just look at the DARPA challenge in robotics, the clumsy robots falling over and laughable. And now you have robots that are doing jumping jacks and turn, you know, literally somersaults. And, that, and they're able to do that now. What are they going to be doing five years from now? And what we have to be worried about, what are they going to be doing 35 or 20 years from now? You see, you see my point? Mm -hmm. So um, there's some technologies that are evolving very fast. And it's because it, they're benefiting from this confluence and intersection of multiple technologies. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Hey, it's been a pleasure. Really appreciate the opportunity and uh, hope I appreciate the diehard fans that stuck around. <laughs> <laughs>